guys so much for all being here. We are going to get real in this session. You know, failure is a part of life. Every being on this planet eventually is returned and reabsorbed into the earth. And Silicon Valley is no different. You know, every single failure ends up fertilizing the next idea, the next company with your talent and your example of what maybe not to do. Uh, but that doesn't change that it can feel absolutely brutal in that moment. And it's totally normal to cry as a founder. In fact, in fact I think it might actually be encouraged. Just I think it's good for your mental health. You know, but Tim's legendary investing career has put him close to so many amazing successes, as well as a lot of incredible failures. But that's part of the game. And he's also really seen the somewhat arbitrary line that can divide those two. So I'm really excited to be talking to you today. And I want to just kick it off by asking, you know, Draper University has this saying. It's an oath that they start each day with that says, <laughs> I fact, I think everybody should stand up. All right, let's do it. Come on. Stand up. Put your hand on your heart. All right. We, there are a couple other lines before this about freedom and trust and that kind of thing. But there is a line that says, I will fail and fail again until I succeed. So you ready, everybody? I will fail and fail again until I succeed. All right, now go on. <laughs> Josh, what was the question? Well, I, I love that you're destigmatizing failure because I think that's something that it can be really terrifying and it can actually really prohibit your growth if you're constantly searching for perfect, which can really be the enemy of good. So I want to ask, what does that statement mean to you and where does it come from? So it was interesting. <laughs> I found that entrepreneurs who were successful were the ones who had had failure in the past because um, Sometimes you'll see, you know, some some superstar who gets straight A's all through uh, high school, college, goes, and then they they come out, and the world is rough and different, and and they'll fail, and they'll it will crush them because they they've never been through failure before. Um, probably one of the reasons that uh, Harvard doesn't see very many entrepreneurs because they all feel like, oh, the world works fine, and I don't need to shake it up. Uh, entrepreneurs need to shake it up. So we, I started to think, well, um, how do I get entrepreneurs to get out of that mindset that's been put in there by academia? Academia, by the way, you get a, you know, an A if you don't make any mistakes. I remember getting an F for some of the most extraordinary things I did because it was outside the, the realm of what the teacher was trying to get out of me. And, uh, and I thought, you know, that, that was actually a cool thing. And sometimes I get an A plus. It'd be like an A plus or an F. Um, That's kind of what failure is about. Right? And I it's thought like, failure is so important because, I mean, all the greatest inventions of the world came from failure. It's like one guy goes out looking for the West Indies and he finds America. One guy, um, a woman, starts feeding moldy bread to, uh, to sick people, to people with infections, and suddenly has, discovers penicillin. Um, somebody tripped and, and put their peanut butter into chocolate, and there was the Reese's peanut butter cup. I mean, electricity was some guy flying a kite. And, uh, and so some of the biggest breakthroughs in the world have come from failure. So I encourage people to go ahead and fail. And think of what freedom that created for you. Didn't it feel good to say, I will fail and fail again until I succeed? OK, now, I, I, I don't know if this is one of your questions, but I'm going to guess that one of your questions is, what were your failures, Tim? And I go ahead and ask. What were your failures, Tim? Good, Josh. I'm so glad you asked. Because um, I have, I've, first of all, I fail more than half the time. Uh, the investments I make fail more than half the time. And knowing that, you think, Wait, why is he still in business? And, uh, but it turns out that every once in a while, one becomes so successful that it makes up for all these failures that I've created. Um, and entrepreneurs who fail, I look at it and I, I just say, well, you move the ball forward. You, you move progress forward, whether you were the winner or you, know, you were the Friendster or MySpace or you were the fa Facebook. Um, it, 
you still moved the ball forward with, uh, when we funded Tesla, it was after I met with a guy named Ian Wright, who took me for <laughs> a drive in this car, and he, and he said, yeah, it's an electric car, and I was thinking I was gonna get a golf cart ride. And he says, strap in to this five-point strap, and I was thinking, what? And he said, safe. He said, he said, and it was put together with PVC tubing and stuff. Anyway, he took me for this ride, and I went, oh my god. This thing takes off like a rocket and stops on a dime. I thought, oh my gosh, you, you don't need to be a golfer or what was called a tree hugger to want an electric car. This is a performance vehicle. And so then I went and I met with a bunch of other people in the electric car business and they, um, they were building interesting things. And there was this guy, Martin Eberhard, who was creating Tesla. And I thought, well, Martin, um, you know, this looks great. Let's, and I funded it. And then that company went, um, it was on its way down, and Elon Musk came in and made the big success. So Ian Wright was a hero there. Martin Eberhard was a hero there. But Elon Musk is the name everybody hears, right? They were all heroic in being entrepreneurs that pushed the edge and they all failed. But my personal failures, are mostly tied to trying to market. So I, I've tried to market to venture capitalists, I mean to entrepreneurs as a venture capitalist. And the first guy I ever um, thought about this with was a guy named um, Edelman. And he ran the biggest PR firm in the world. And I thought, well, I'll ask him you know, what I should be doing. He said, you know, what, what do you suggest? Um, as the greatest PR mind in the world, what do you suggest? And he said, I suggest you become your own media company. That was the advice, become your own media company. So I went out and I thought, okay, I'll try to be my own media company. And I, I started with a podcast. Anybody seen my podcast? No. Um, then I went and I did a Twitch show, a show on Twitch. Anybody seen my show on Twitch? No, total failure. Um, I, then I did Startup U, which was a reality show around Draper University, and it's a fantastic show if you can never get a hold of it. But another failure, huge, disastrous failure. And then um, recently, I, I thought, well, I'll just try one more thing, and, and uh, I, I wanted to do a, a show where I interview entrepreneurs and the audience, the, the viewers could invest. That was my idea. And I, I thought I would bring in my dad and my kids and my sister and call it Meet the Drapers and have it be a show. Well, it turns out we have 40 million viewers of Meet the Drapers uh, from nothing. And all of a sudden, and I, who knew that that was going to be a thing? But um, I just failed and failed and failed again until I succeeded. And our first, at Draper University, we started by just sort of like taking, grabbing people and taking anybody, come to my school. It'll be four weeks, it'll be, or eight weeks or whatever. And it, it'll be fantastic. And I brought them all in and I didn't really know what I was doing. And they all showed up and I thought, oh, okay, we better, better get this thing, this show on the road. And, um, and they all came to Draper University, this hotel I had bought that had been boarded up for eight years. And they were all living there. And they woke up that morning and everybody flushed the toilet and put on the shower at the same time. And the whole place flooded. <laughs> and I thought, well, this is such an amazing disaster. And my partner, Andy Tang, um, is Chinese, and he said, water, good luck. And I thought, oh, yeah, it doesn't seem like it. I handed out plungers to everybody as they came in. You know, welcome to Draper University. Here's your plunger. And uh, you should just make that like an ongoing thing. It, was, it really sets the tone right. Yeah. The plunger, we actually had a, a hackathon with just plungers. We said, OK, whatever you do, you've got to invent something and you got to use the plunger in some way. 
And there were some quite inventive things. Anyway, but Draper University, we stuck with it. And now, what is it? It's been 11 years. 11 years later, now we've had 3,500 students in there. And they've come from 102 different countries. And they've started 800 companies. And they've been enormous successes. And they've made me money. So it's actually paid for the failure. I mean, the school has. The school loses money because we give away a lot of scholarships and whatever else. But overall, it has made me money. Uh, so it's actually become from the, the depths of failure, we somehow had a success. Uh, so I just recommend you just keep trying stuff. Just keep going. Try it, try it, try it. And throw stuff up there. Get out fast. Find a customer, delight the customer, find another customer, delight the customer, find another customer, delight the customer. And then you have three delighted customers. That is that is all you need for a company to become an enormous success. Awesome. So I want to ask a little bit about how do you know when to quit, actually? Because that can be one of the hardest questions. Uh, for the production team, we don't have the time up here. If you could just uh, set that up for us. Thank you so much. No, they froze. Oh, yeah, we have an infinite in amount of time for us. All right. No, we're frozen in time. So you know, awesome. you're, you're living in an alternate universe right now. <laughs> yes, it does seem like we've, everything is taking forever. Uh, OK, so let's ask a little bit about, you know, you've had some incredible successes investing in things like Hotmail, Cruise, you know, a huge believer in Bitcoin early, Coinbase. But you've also had some moments where things didn't work out and there wasn't a path forward. You know, you, you famously uh, move, uh, moved to see if we could split California into six different states. Oh, yeah, uh, politically, I am a fail, fail, <laughs> fail, fail. <laughs> And they honestly, it got a, succeed. this got a lot of signatures because, you know, giving us more Senate representation, maybe easier to govern a smaller set of states. Uh, but eventually, the, Supreme, the California Supreme Court just blocked this from even being on the ballot. And you haven't moved forward with that. That was kind of a nasty. That was a rough one. That was like, like they pulled a fast one. I, totally. I just, uh, I'm not as dirty a trickster as the <laughs> unions are here. So when do you, when do you know as a, a founder when to say, we've pivoted, we've tried different things, we've tried a different customer, we've gotten all the advice we can, we've, we've, but at some point, you just have to quit and try something either completely new or maybe go back to the drawing board, spend some time working for companies, learn about a new problem that you want to solve. How do you call it? Like, when do you Actually, know that's, call it? That is really interesting because I am never going to call it. I look at California. I mean, OK, if, if any of you guys vote socialist, go, go to San Francisco. It's a great socialist town. And like they've quadrupled the homeless every year for the last three years. So I don't recommend socialism. Doesn't work. I highly recommend San Francisco. It's an amazing place. The energy, because of the AI boom, is incredible. Don't listen to it. <laughs> Honestly, it's fantastic. Yeah, AI boom, yeah, is, of course, is the capitalist side of San Francisco. Actually, Redwood City, this place is hopping. Um, so I, 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 won't, uh, I won't give up on the long-term outcome. Like, I want California to succeed. I want this to continue to be this mecca for AI, for software, for internet, for Bitcoin for whatever. I want it to be the mecca, continue to be the mecca. And we need freedom for that. We need the freedom to innovate and fail. Um, and uh, the politics has, have not allowed that because the interests of a government union, I like unions. I don't like government unions. The interests of a government union are everybody's the same, and they're all a part of our union. That's their interest. They have to all be the same which means no one can make any mistakes and no one can fail. So anyway, I have a long-term mission. It's got to happen. I just haven't figured out how to get there. And, the, um, and I've been blocked at every, you know, even though the people want these things, uh, the unions are more, the government unions are more um, politically savvy and more controlling. So I, we, I haven't been able to succeed. That's so okay. that is a big, you know, that's an ongoing failure for me. That's fine. So, okay, so how do you learn so, from So what, what you might do is say, what's my North Star? And then try something. 
And if that thing doesn't work, then think, OK, we need to do something else. Let's try something else. Let's fail again and fail until we find the North Star and we get there. Yeah, it's like about finding, not, you know, not necessarily changing your mission, changing the way that you get there, or changing the framing of the problem, or going and finding that education, putting it on hold, getting that experience until you're ready. I mean, I know one of the, my biggest failures as a journalist, uh, I got the call that Facebook had just bought Instagram. I was like at a restaurant, I literally ran down the street to a coffee shop where there was Wi-Fi, immediately started typing as fast as I could, and still, I was, you know, I was like, oh, but like, what is my analysis? What do I think about this? Why does this matter? And then I look, and Kara Swisher had published the story that well, she like, was already I, ahead of you. She she got the call first from me, and I vowed to just never get beaten again. And I wanted to become the fastest gun in the West. And I realized that you know, being like being perfect, trying to be accurate always, and having everything polished before you get out the door is often one of the easiest ways to fail. And that instead, putting something out there and iterating on top of it is a much better approach often because you get that immediate feedback. And that's what I did going forward. I published articles in as little as four minutes with two sentences because what mattered was the news and I didn't want to get in the way of that. And so I think finding that way to bounce back from failure is important, but you also have to learn from those mistakes. And you know, I think I like to hear that first time founders say that like what matters is product and second time founders know that what matters is distribution. distribution. But I think what third time founders are really learning is what matters is who you work with and who's around you. And you know, that's why we try to do that with Beacon at our venture fund. We built this AI program over the last 10 years that helps our companies find the best possible recruits, the best people for any job. They're the most likely to leave their current position because they know that those first few hires define the company culture, define so much of who else you get to partner with and have around the table with you. But how do you think about learning from failures? What do you, how do you learn how to extract it? Do you do like a big post mortem? Them? Do you go have like a you know a vision quest and spend some time by yourself in the desert? Do you uh, you know what is it that helps you unlock the learnings and apply them to your next adventure? I'm laughing because I'm thinking I try never to even think. About, I just think that didn't work. Now what? <laughs> All right. It's a little like um, I don't know if you play chess. Um, you you move the, and you think you've got this great plan. And then the other guy moves, and all of a sudden you go, oh my god, I totally blew it. Now what? So I think that there's something to that. Like, just now what? How did, somebody said uh, it was like, um, success is jumping from failure to failure with great alacrity. <laughs> um, I kind of feel that way, that it's, it, I just keep, um, keep trying. Keep going, keep because if something's not working, then you then you go, okay, I did that wrong. I'm doing. My dad, my son asked my father. He said, my son said, boy, raising money is really tough. I've been raising money for my fund, and it's been really really tough. And my father said, you must be doing something wrong. And it was a way for him to sort of shake up my son, and my son kind of goes, oh. Yeah, maybe I'm maybe I'm not presenting it well. Maybe I'm not thinking it through. Maybe I need to redefine myself. And uh, and I think having that openness, I think, is good. So having some sort of an openness to like uh, criticism, to uh, you know, when something's not quite right, you gotta know it and and adjust. And what's great is a startup. Think about, I, I, li I like to think of it as ships in the ocean. A big company, you know, Microsoft, they've been able to move pretty quickly. But um, anyway, big company is this giant freighter in the ocean. And if you try to, and if all of a sudden they, they have to move, they have to change direction, you know, maybe two degrees, maybe five degrees. They can maybe move just to get to, to adjust. But a little ship, a startup in the ocean, can turn on a dime and start heading in an entirely different direction. So as a startup, you're, you can be more um, flexible. And you can adjust. And you can try new things. And you can say, hey, this, you know, this isn't working in the ocean. Let's go and move to something else. 
Okay, so there, you talked about defining and redefining yourself, but I know that a lot of people in part define themselves by their profession, and that's been especially tough in Silicon Valley lately because there have been so many layoffs, especially at the big fang companies. And I want to just give up a heartening word that we use our Beacon AI data system at SignalFire, and we looked at the layoffs, uh, and we found that over 60% of the people laid off by fang companies in the last year are still looking for work. Like, they still don't have a new job. So if that's you out there, you are not alone. But what is your advice to people if you know their their startup doesn't work out, their employment doesn't work out, they get laid off. What do you do next to jump and bounce back from that? So, um, if you're in a startup, I recommend going to a big company. If you in a startup and it's failed and you decided, okay, that we we don't have any way forward. We've just you know no money, whatever. Um, I I tend to recommend to go to a big company to heal. Um, and if to rest, you're in a, <laughs> to relax. <laughs> and if you're in a big company um, and you're laid off, I recommend thinking about what kind of a startup to create. So um, it, and and the reason for that is what you've got to what you got to understand if you're laid off is that you can make your own job. You can make. We, we have this great thing at Draper University. Um, we, we say, well, Harvard and Stanford say 85% of their graduates get jobs when they get out. And we say our average student creates seven jobs. So I highly recommend that kind of thinking when you are laid off. Uh, particularly at a time like this when, you know, getting hired, the other option is actually move to another place. I mean, when, when it's crashing in one place, it's usually booming in another. Um, you know, go to Riyadh or, or uh, Dubai, and they are booming, and they're hiring as quickly as they can. Uh, not all in technology, but they are booming. And, uh, you know, other parts of the world are booming. Um, Here's another situation where there's this, our, our government has messed with us. Um, it turns out the best governments are the ones that trust their people and set them free. And the worst governments are the ones that, are control, that control people and have to control people. The weak leaders try to control people. Weak leaders are like Putin or President Xi. They, they feel they have to tell everybody what to do. They think they know better. The strong leaders are like George Washington, who said, no, nah, I'm not going to be king. There isn't going to be a king. I'm going to set our people free. Everybody's going to be free. And all of a sudden, America is this incredible, huge success. So our government has gotten to be more controlling here. And in controlling everybody, they, they created a lockdown because there was a pandemic. Then they sent everybody money. Then they're surprised that they have inflation. Then they're, they, they've raised interest rates. Then there are bank failures, and then they have to try to hold those up. It's like, if you didn't mess with it in the first place, we would have been fine. And, uh, and we're not now. Uh, in fact, I mean, it's a, an amazing argument for Bitcoin. I had all these companies, all these portfolio companies coming to me after that Silicon Valley collapse. And they said, um, we got an emergency. Uh, we've got all our money in Silicon Valley Bank. And, and on Monday, we got to make payroll. And uh, so I didn't know whether to be magnanimous and say, OK, I'll loan you money for a day, or, uh, or be draconian and say, well, I'll give you money, but do, 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 do. I was a little bit of each, just for the record. Um, but when, you, when we had that, all I was thinking was, my Bitcoin is the safest money I've got. And then I was thinking, OK, all you companies, we have to, we have to rethink the way we, we operate a treasury. Like, I fund you, you build a big business, you throw off a lot of cash, where do you keep it? Well. In my, in my mind, you've got to have at least two payrolls worth of Bitcoin in there. 
Because if the banking system, you know, Silicon Valley Bank could have been the first domino and the whole system could have collapsed. It's a good thing the government stepped in and backstopped it, right? So maybe yeah. not all bad. No, but you see what happened. And now they're blaming the Silicon Valley Bank. Oh, they did it wrong. The government screwed it up. And now they, that, was a one, that was one thing the government finally, by stepping in, it was like, good, you saved it. But now they should actually deregulate those banks. And all they're doing is trying to regulate them. By deregulate them, then, I mean, Bitcoin's just better currency than dollars or whatever. It's just better. And we're going to move from a fiat world to a crypto world. It's just going to happen. But getting there is going to go through one of two directions. One is if the government overregulates and tells everybody what to do, they'll tell the banks you can't use crypto, they'll do that. Those banks are going to have a huge monster collapse. But if the banks are allowed to use crypto and bring crypto into our system, then, um, then you're going to have a much smoother transition. What's and I think our government just, they, they want to tell everybody what to do. Well, I know better than you do what everybody should be doing. And so they create more rules, and then the businesses have to live under more rules. And then it's like, eventually the businesses say, I'm going to Texas, or I'm going to Dubai. And, and it's, you, you have a, I mean, this, this really does get, and, and it's a creeping thing, because if you're a bureaucrat, what's your role? It's like, I'm supposed to regulate. So they create more regulation. And there's no, I think they should be paid on an incentive basis where they get paid not based on CPI increases, but on the increases of GDP growth. And then you'll see more alignment with government. You'll feel a lot better about how each of you are operating. You know, when I was growing up. I think we gotta let, we gotta let okay. everyone go, but. Okay, one more thing. When I was growing up here, I always thought the government worked for us. They were us, and they worked for us. And today I feel like I have to work for the government. And uh, so we gotta change that. So go out there, change it. Well, I hope that hopefully you know, the, or your own failures unlock that sense of freedom. Hopefully failures of banks and governments and anything will open up that opportunity to say, what can we change? What can we do better? And I think you did a great job of talking this through. You know, Keep that North Star. Keep finding that way forward. Maybe the, the path there has to change. And you, know, you have to jump with alacrity between those failures to find your way to success. And you know, sometimes if you're, if you're doing one thing, if you're in a startup that fails, go to a big company. You're at a big company that fails uh, or does layoffs, go to the small company, change your perspective, and know that you know, the scientific method requires failure. So let's all go out there and uh, do some science, I guess. But if you do end up succeeding instead of failing, we'd love to hear about you at Signal Fire. We'd love to help you out with AI uh, for recruiting so that you can get the best partners around. Because like we said, third time founders know that real success and failure is d distinguished by the people around you. So hope you find some wonderful people to work with around you today at this conference. Thanks so much. Enjoy it. Terrific. Thanks, Jeff.